if you have babies, things like that. So I think it's really good for women. It's also, you also get to have very meaningful patient relationship as well. Okay. Um, but I have to be honest, dental school was like the hardest thing I've ever did in my life. It was mentally, cha mentally challenging. Like the some of the instructors there were pretty nasty. They're like really there to put down your self-esteem. But I think they want to train you to be tough because some of the patients you will encounter, especially as a young dentist, they're pretty rude to you. So you got to be like tough. And it was very physically demanding as well. Um, a typical schedule was like eight to five as lectures, either on dentistry or medicine. And then you would practice, you will have one hour of dinner or practice clinical stuff from six to nine. You can see on the bottom right pictures, that is our SIM clinic. Um, we're pretty privileged in UBC that cl SIM clinic happens in every cubicle. We don't have to, so that really simulates the posture and you know, patients and chairs and delivery system. So every student will have a little cubicle and you will work on the dummy head from eight to, uh, from five to nine. And after nine, you will go back to school again to study more until midnight. And then you repeat uh, for five days a week. And on the weekend, sometimes there is volunteer clinics. Um, so on the bottom left picture, that one is, you know, volunteer clinics or the weekend clinics, you can participate. So yeah, I would definitely recommend you to live on campus if, uh, if, if that's possible, especially during the third year, that's the clinical rotations here. Um, it's very demanding of you. So on the top left side, that one is uh, during right co white coat ceremony. And I'm just going to share a little bit about the fun stuff in dental school. Um, you get to go, you get to meet a lot of people, you get to build really meaningful friendships. Our class was only 50 people, and that's probably why it's so difficult to get into Canadian schools. Um, so I was very close with everybody in my class. You get to go to all the fun parties. Um, dentistry is a multi-billion industry. When you get into school, you will be approached by a lot of different banks, different dental companies. They throw you like the funnest, like the, yeah, the really cool dental parties you will get to do. And on the top right picture, that one's definitely the highlight of uh, dental school for me. I was able to go on a two weeks exchange program in Japan. So I was in Tokyo for a week and I was in Niigata for a week. Japan, ja J dentistry in Japan is a lot more advanced than, than in Canada. They get to work on like dummy robots. Their dummy head was able to speak, to choke. There's saliva to suction. Anyway, it's really cool. And UBC, when I was in, still in school, there was a lot of exchange programs that you can participate. You can go to Korea, you can go to Taiwan, you can go to Japan. And I highly recommend you to consider that if, if UBC is your choice. The picture in the middle, that one's based, uh, that was me catching my first really heavy salmon in a, on a First Nation Reserve in Bella Bella, which is on the coast of uh, BC. I, went, I work as a student practitioner in this First Nation Reserve at the end of my third year. That experience really made me gain confidence as a dentist because in school, when you're doing sim lab or when you're doing patient care in school, you will spend three hours setting up, cleaning up, uh, getting approval from instructors just to do one filling. But in, pra in private practice, in three hours, that is, I'm able to see in like five patients with five fillings each already so it's definitely not realistic but UBC does provide you experience um, opportunity at the end of your third year to be able to shadow and to work as a student practitioner so I was able to work in a private clinic seeing patients at my own pace and that really made me feel more comfortable graduating um, okay we can go to the next slide
Uh, oh, I can see you. I think you're just muted right now. All good? Yeah, all good. <laughs> Sorry oh, okay. about that. That's okay. So um, in my YouTube video, I made a video about if you should go rural after you graduate, if you're interested in knowing that. I mean, it's probably a little bit too early to think about that right now. But before you graduate, I definitely recommend you check out that video to to uh, to see if that's a good option for you. So I was there. I was one of the many associates in a really big uh, dental practice. Um, it was challenging in terms of work culture. There was, it was tough. There was a lot of favorism, clinical, like, like the clinic politics going on. But clinically, I was able to make quite a bit of money and I was able to get mentorship on extractions and molar root canals, which are the two procedures that most dental students will feel very inadequate of uh, um, after graduating. So that that made me feel like that helped me have a lot of skills under my belt. After a year and a half, I was able to come back to Vancouver, BC and apply to very competitive jobs. So now I am working in W Dental in downtown Vancouver. It's a pretty high end dental clinic. Um, and we, I do all sorts of procedures as a general dentist. I'm also the main dentist in the clinic. Um, and without my experience in a rural community, I don't think I would be able to get this position. Okay, and what is my next step? My next step is right now I'm doing a startup with my husband. My husband is the guy uh, wearing the really big glasses on the lower left side with really long big teeth in the front. <laughs> he is my classmate and he is also a dentist. So we're doing a startup together. Um, yeah, so that's pretty exciting. Um, next person, uh, next slide. Okay. So as I mentioned, I do all aspects of dentistry. When I was in Red Deer, I was the pedodontist of my clinic. So I see all the different kids. I did think I did think about, oh, maybe I should go into school to uh, specialize in pedo, but I decided to stay as a general dentist because. Sometimes I also enjoy surgical uh, extraction. Sometimes I still enjoy root canals. So I want to keep my options open. I think I get bored really easily. So if I need to do the same procedure all the time in a day, I go crazy. So as a general dentist, you, you know, it's pretty interesting. You, you, like the things you can do is it's endless, right? So you can see on this slide, on the top left picture, that one is me with my small patient. Um, I did ortho on her. I did a couple extractions on her. It was a meaningful picture for me because she was always been a long-term patient in a pedo office. She would not see any dentist. She cries, she yells. But, um, you know, with, with kids, you, you have to... You have to give them choice. You have to understand why they're fearful and you just have to speak their language. And I think that skills is transferable to adult patients as well. So she wrote me a thank you card. The whole family got me a whole gift before I left. The kid cry because she won't see me anymore. You know, it's moments like this just makes you feel like it's so worth it to become a dentist. And it was, you will have a lot of these moments in your career. Um, and I think that should be the driving force of, of you becoming an excellent dentist. Um, the middle picture that's the most recent root canals that I did. Um, the, when you see a root canals, how to judge whether it's a good root canals or not, you want to make sure the white filling part in the middle of the tooth goes all the way until the end of the root. And the access where the cavity is, it's conservative. Um, so root canal procedure is fun for me. It's quiet. I do enjoy it. On the right side, that one is an example of an expander case that I did. You can see on the top right pictures, the tooth is a lot more inward. It er erupts more towards the tongue. After you put a removable expander, after four months, the teeth actually move back to where it's supposed to be. So things like that, they're not, you're not taught any of the ortho stuff in school, you have to take a lot of continuous education. 
And on the lower left side, that one is just a typical wisdom teeth um, x-rays that, uh, that you, you will see before an extraction. So now, uh, next slide, please. So now in my office, I do a lot of cosmetic cases now because I'm uh, serving downtown demographics. On the left side, that one is just like a mini smile design that I did. Um, you can see that we do the composite buildup on the front teeth, the middle teeth, and also the canines becomes a lot sharper. You can see the color blend in beautifully. You can barely see the junction. Um, and so far, the patient has been really happy. Um, of course, it's not a permanent solution. It's really much easier to chip compared to crowns and veneers, but it's a it's gotten very popular over the years um, and it's very predictable as well. It's a good one. It's a cheaper option to test out um, these kind of smile design cases. I recently got into Botox. That's my assistant. Botox is the best invention you can have for women. And it was my Christmas present for all my staff. They're all really happy. And you can see that before and after. Um, I am planning to continue to do more Botox in terms of helping to shape our smile. For example, some patients will have very gummy smile. Their smile is really high. You can give a Botox in the, on the top of the lip and the lip will drop. So Botox, it's, it's, it goes hand in hand for smile design. And also, it's very important. Some patients, they grind and clench a lot, but they can't tolerate night guard. They suffer migraine. They suffer from headaches. You can give Botox in your jaw. That pretty much relax the muscles, and that alleviates a lot of their discomfort. This is all continuous education. You don't get to learn that in school. But I just want to show you that you will never get bored as a general dentist because there's always new things you can learn. So um, to get to where I am right now, in addition to having, like you need to finish all the prerequisites and that includes two courses of English in your first year of undergrad, two years of chemistry course in your first year of undergrad, two years of organic chemistry in your second year of undergrad, and two courses of biochemistry in your third year of undergrad. So if you ask me, um, what is the shortest route to become a dentist? Definitely three years of undergrad because you need to take all the courses, but it can take longer. Okay, let's see. And then after that, you will take DAT, which is an entrance standardized exams. You will get offered an interview if um, your application looks good. The interview consists of MMI style and uh, small group style. If you're interested in how to do well in interviews, you can also check out my YouTube videos. I just recently invited a UBC DMD interviewer to talk about it. Um, and then after four years of dental school, you can um, you just write the MBD entrance exam, which is a national exam that will qualify you to become a dentist. Can you fail dental school? Yes, you absolutely can. Um, there was... My class was a really excellent class. Everybody was super smart and hardworking. Nobody failed anything. But the class up below me, there was two students failed twice. One student failed once. And um, the, the national exam, you can also fail too. So it is definitely a grind. It's not like you get into dental school and you're all set. But uh, there are a lot of resources that can help you. Um, okay, so that is about me and what I'm doing now. We can talk about a interesting, well, I have two cases, two short cases to share, share with you guys. We can have the next slide. So this, this case, it's, um, it's not particularly interesting clinically or anything like that, but it's very common. So I want to give you a, just like a glimpse of what we do almost every day. These type of lesions are called abfraction, and they are caused by excessive force that usually from grinding, clenching, or sometimes in combination with aggressive toothbrushing. So you can imagine, I don't know, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, right. You guys see my screen? 
yeah, yeah hopefully can, can yeah. Um, okay so like so when um so let's say this is your tooth whenever you bite down your teeth will flex okay there will be micro movements and when you bite down really hard constantly and the teeth keeps bending the enamel pretty much chips away at the gum line and that's basically what's happening right now you see that wet shape that it's gone in uh, at the end of the uh, above the gum a lot of dentists or a lot of patients will think oh i have recession but that's not recession you see the gum is still scalloped it's still um, at the right position you simply have loss of enamel i see that very it, this is really common you see this in one in probably every three to five patients a lot of times it can be asymptomatic, especially in patients who are, um, are a little bit older. When you get older, your teeth becomes more tough. Just like when you play guitar for a long time, your fingers start to grow callus. And same as your teeth. As we age, our teeth will um, lay down tertiary dentin, which is like the harder type of dentin that makes it less prone to sensitivity. Um but this case, you can see the left picture there, it's not a clean loss of enamel. If it's clean, you will see it really glossy, but you can see it's a little mushy and it's brown because it's combined with cavities. When you leave these lesions untreated for a long time, the dentin underneath the enamel, which is the softer part of the tooth, is a lot more porous and more susceptible more susceptible to cavities. That's basically what's happening here. You can see really brown. So on the picture on the right side is the pictures after I removed all the cavities. Well, I thought I removed all the cavities, but you can see it's still a little pink in the middle, right? So at the end of my uh, cav cavities removal, I will always drop a pink solution. It's called a caries detector to stain the dentin. And the pink is going to be able to stain any remaining cavities. So there's still a a little bit more cavities in the middle, which I removed afterwards. And take this picture to show you, this is what it looks like. You see in the middle of the pink, there is almost like a, um, uh, like a little circle there. And that is where the nerve is, like where the pulp is, where it houses the nerve. So this is a very deep cavity. Um, and you can imagine that this patient was in pain. So it was in, very sensitive. She's always been avoiding brushing this area, hence the cavities. Um, and we are extremely close to the nerve. <clears throat> so you always want to warn the patient that there is a chance that teeth like that will turn into um, root canal. So this is basically the bread and butter of dentistry. We do this every day. Uh, second picture. So this is the picture of the two. Sorry, second slide. I mean, next slide. So this is a picture of the tooth immediately after I place a filling. A um, couple of things here. In order to place a really good filling at these spots, it's tricky because you can see the filling was really close to the gum. So there would be a lot of bleeding and saliva during this time. And moisture control and hemostasis, which, which means... Uh, stopping the bleeding is very crucial in term in, ter in order to make sure the longevity of the fillings. There are many couple things you can do to to, but you will learn more about that in dental school. There are different chemicals we can dip the gum in. We can pack cords, things like that. So I just want to see, show you like this is an after picture, and you can try to imagine the before picture is such a big difference. So you're not only just treating the disease itself, the patient was so happy at the end of the treatment because this is not the only tooth that's like that in her mouth. We are doing quadrant here. Um, she has about, I think, about 15 teeth that are like that. So she has always been trying to avoiding smile, always avoiding anything that's really cold. So after we finished all the treatment, the patient was really, really happy and a lot more motivated to brush well. And she actually books back regular hygiene appointments afterwards. And we actually became quite close. And now she is doing Invisalign treatments with me and she wants to do um, 
a smile design at the end with me. Um, so as a, I get these questions a lot on my Instagram, I am a young dentist and I do look young as well, but how do I build trust and rapport with the patients? I start with small procedures first. I start with their chief concern, what's hurting them first. And I do really well on those procedures. Really well, what I mean by really well is I make sure the procedure and the treatment is pain, painless, it's pain-free for them. I have very good chair side manner gain their trust and make sure the work is really good. Um, it doesn't give them any discomfort afterwards and lasts a long time and they will trust you. And at the end of the day, they will see past your appearance, past your age, they will trust your professional uh, judgments here. So I, I don't get bothered by my young look anymore. Okay, next case, next slide. So this slide is pretty interesting. Um, I saw this lady in 2020 uh, this year. So she is a 56 years old female, um, autistic, otherwise healthy. She doesn't have any dental insurance. Her chief complaint was not pain, was that her, she said, the lower right side doctor, there seemed to be something growing out of my gum. And I took an x-ray. Oh, my goodness. You see the tooth supporting the bridge is split right in half in one of the root. And the picture on the right side, that thing that's poking out is the broken fragments of the root is swimming up, swimming out of the gum. Um, and I looked at it. And she's been a patient in this clinic for a long time. How come this is so bad like there's nothing we can do at this moment we have to extract the tooth and you can see the x-ray here just pay attention to the x-ray you see there's a black halo surrounding the root when when you see the black halo surrounding the root like that on an x-ray that means there's an active infection going on why does it appear black it's because when there's bacteria in your bone the bacteria is trying to get out so it eats away the bone or whatever it's in its way. It's trying to escape. When, when the bacteria eats away the bone, it becomes in hollow space. When you have more air in the space, the x-ray can travel through more, more easily and causing this black space in your bone. So this is really big infection. And when you have such a big infection in the uh, in the jaw, well, I mean, the patient's healthy, but if the patient's not too healthy, it's dangerous because we got a big nerve, big uh, blood supply in our jaw, it can easily travel down to your heart and cause sepsis. Um, so we definitely don't want to leave these big infections in the mouth for a long time. Um, I want to share with you, uh, next slide, I want to share with you, you see in 2015, 2018, this is not, that was not the first time that she was told something is wrong with that tooth. She came in 2015. Do you see how the black was so much smaller? And the black was only surrounding one root. So in 2015, there was already an infection going on there. Maybe a fracture, small fracture, we're not sure. But the infection was much smaller. And sometimes when that happens, it's still treatable. But in 2018, three years after, you see the infection is starting to spread. So the tooth is hopeless. There's nothing we can do about it. It's not causing her much pain because the tooth is already root canal treated, meaning there's no more nerve anymore. Just occasionally when she bite down, it might be a little bit sore in the jaw due to such a big infection. How will we treat this case? We will section the bridge right at the end of the third last tooth right there. We'll section the bridge right there and remove the infected tooth and probably put bone in the uh, put bone graft in the bone and get implants or denture afterwards. Um, this is an interesting case because you can see the development of inf uh, infection left untreated clinically and uh, radiographically on x-ray as well. But that leads to me to a the last topic I want to talk about, which is it's all about patient education. And you will find in the US or in Canada, dentistry is private. It's so expensive. So it's not accessible to everybody. And um, you really need to create value in your practice. So we can look at the next slide. This is something I want to kind of talk more about because um, if you asked many dentists, 
they will, this is something that dentists can really hate about being a dentist. In Taiwan or in Asia's uh, or area where dentistry is partially covered by government is different. You will feel like you're more of a healthcare provider. Um, you don't have to not sell, but you don't have to do a lot of treatment planning or convincing. But in North America, people expect you to deliver good customer service. People expect you to, um, to, because they pay a lot out of pocket. Whereas for medicine, it's okay if the doctors is late. It's okay if the doctor canceled them last minute. It's okay if the doctor is a little bit rough or not nice because it's, they, in their mind, it's free. Whereas in dentistry, it's very expensive. Um, so the patients actually become quite demanding us sometimes, but it's all about how you manage it, educate it, and create value in what you do. And But before you do that, you have to believe the value in what you do. I do have to say there are some of my colleagues who don't like to become a dentist because of this aspect of dentistry. You're constantly kind of bending backward to serve the patient. But in my mind, I don't see it that way. I see it more like, I'm here to educate, I'm here to help, and they can they can feel it. Um, patients can usually smell bullshit. They can they know when you are recommending treatments only for their own benefits. Um, and I just want to give an example. For example, I rarely give discounts. Um, there was one patient who actually come to see me from my old practice, uh, which is uh, two towns away from where I work right now. And the commute is about an hour. She comes to see me all the time and we're doing a, quite a bit of treatment now. We're probably going to do a smile design crowns from the canine to canine on the top and crowns on the canine is about a $20,000 treatment and she does not have insurance. She's my really long-term patient. And she asked me if I can give her any discount um, I thought about it. I just like when you drive a BMW, when you go buy a BMW, they never give you any discount. But why would you still buy BMW over Toyota sometimes? It's because the service. It's because you believe the car is safer. You believe that there's value in the money you spend. So same goes to dentistry. I didn't give her any discount, but what I did for her is I offer her I offer to cover all her transportation costs. Um, and I also offer if she needs to, sometimes if there's surgical procedure, she needs to, she doesn't want to go back home or travel so far. I offer to pay for her cab, taxi, or if you really want to stay, I will pay for hotels for her. You know, things like that to add value to what I do, but I don't necessarily give discounts. Or uh, on the monetary level, unless if it's a, you know, if patient actually communicates with me like single mom or elderly, um, they just, they will not go forward with the treatment unless if it's a certain price and I, I do help them in that case. So being a dentist is so rewarding. You get to help people who you like and the patients you uh, in need. Um, and I do really value that aspect of dentistry. You do not lose that human side of you and you don't get carried away by money. I always go by a quote, you don't chase money, you chase success and the money will follow. And it's so true for dentistry. Um, dentistry is lucrative. It is really easy to become not a good dentist. Um, there's many shady things you can do, but you know what? At the end of the day, you have to be proud of yourself and um, the patient can really see when you're a good dentist. So I just want to motivate you guys and, and show that it is amazing to become a dentist. They are bad, bad days for sure, but in my mind is still the best profession and I don't regret a, a bit um, by choosing this route. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, so the last little slide is just that you're probably at the stage where you're just thinking about dentistry. Some people are so sure about dentistry, that you really want to go for it. Some people are still kind of not sure, or some people have tried and um, didn't get in the first time. But I just want to remind you, dream big, eyes on the prize. If you don't land on the stars, at least you will land on the cloud. 
and you will definitely struggle. And I'm still struggling whenever I learn a new procedure or whenever there's like really difficult patient management cases. I still struggle. I get stressed all the time, but you don't give up and you will only get better. And you don't compare with others. Um, you just go at your own pace. Okay, so we have some questions for Q and A. Mm -hmm. Hold on. So somebody is asking: Will enamel rebuild itself when it's damaged? Um, enamel will only rebuild itself when it's worn. So enamel consists of calcium, and there is calcium in your saliva. You are able to remineralize your teeth to a certain degree. But if you have the loss of enamel structure, like the case like that, the whole enamel is gone, including some of the dentin. No, for sure, you can rebuild it. But our teeth, like from regular grinding or eating, you're chipping away your enamels gradually, your enamel does get remineralized. Or if you do get small cavities just in the enamel, it is able to remineralize itself. But once it gets to the dentin or once it gets too big, then no, it's irreversible. Uh, somebody's also asking, what are the side effects of using Botox for, he for a headache? And would you give Botox for any person having a headache? So headache can, um, headache can be a result of many things. But when I give Botox, I don't guarantee them that is is to treat headaches because that is kind of like a side bonus of Botox, like so what my patient tells me, oh, after the treatment, my headache gets a lot better. But that's not an effect where you can promise. You only promise on um, relaxation of muscle. So, for example, if you get Botox in, in your head and your in your uh, frown line here, you will guarantee them in two weeks, you will see that you cannot frown anymore. That's something you can guarantee. But you can tell them, but if you get headache, if you get tension headache, sometimes it will help. So I do not give, um, I do not give Botox to solely treat headache, but that's more of an adjunct to the cosmetic treatments that I do. Okay, uh, someone is asking, what is your favorite procedure to perform and why? It's really hard to answer because you change, you really change throughout uh, your career. In the beginning, I really like seeing children because I, I feel very accomplished when no other dentists can treat them and I'm able to get things done without them crying and having them still like me at the end is like very rewarding moment. But children dentistry is extremely draining, especially in um, general uh, dent dental practice patient, uh, the, the children's are not sedated, right? So uh, there's a lot of constant attentions you need to put in to manage them. Um, I, now my ideal is if I can see one or two children a day, I'll be happy. But more than that, I, I get too tired. It's procedures that has the, that gets me the most interested right now, which is I'm currently spending a lot of time in its smile design. Uh, more of the cosmetic cases. I don't plan to go into the surgery like the implant because as I mentioned, my husband is also a dentist. So we're trying to kind of divide and conquer. I'm going to focus more cosmetic, orthodontics, um, children dentistry. He's going to do more uh, implant surgery, um, sinus lift, these kind of big cases like that. So uh, we're trying to divide it up. But I am really liking the whole cosmetic um, part right now. But cosmetic, we're not talking about these like big smile transformation, even small things like patient chip, the front teeth. It's It takes a lot more skills than we think to be able to do a filling that matches perfectly, that has seamless, um, borderless um, margin and um, have the color match perfectly as well. And you see the immediate results um, and you see the patient's confidence just gets boosted right at the end of the procedure. And that's very, very rewarding. Mm -hmm. What kind of challenges did you face being an associate within a larger group of dentists? <laughs> 
<laughs> hmm, that's probably why I created YouTube in the first place. Is one day I'm going to make this video. Uh, and uh, it's it's a long video, uh, but in short, what what are some challenges you can face? Number one is. You know, some pe people think that when you graduate from dental school, you're the boss in the clinic. No, nope. you are the last person in the whole food chain. <laughs> your dent, your assistant is your boss. Your receptionist is your boss. Um, and when you're in such a big pra practice like that, they will be. It just like the receptionist might not like you compare as much compared to the other dentists. So if there's a new patient walk in, they might give the the new patient to another doctor, you know, things will be like, things like that, the little things will be unfair. Or for example, if you trim plant a crown, if you, if the assistant doesn't really like you, you know, think they can still move patients around. So as an associate in such a large practice, especially practice where there's a lot of drama going on, it's pretty stressful because you have to kind of please everybody and be liked by everybody. And uh, when a small big practice like that you don't really get to do things in your way you get to be trained into treatment plan into a certain way but everything is still ethical of course i will not do anything that's unethical but for example like um certain steps in a new patient exam if I want to take more photos, if I want to take more x-rays, I probably can't because there's a standardized protocol. Um, they want to make sure that, and there, we have three managers and that drove me nuts. I think I'm more of a person of my own boss, like having three managers micromanaging me and overseeing my schedule, it just drives me crazy. I get called to the office to talk when my schedule is not busy. I get called to the office to talk when my schedule is too busy. I get off, I get called to, I get asked, yeah, I get called into the office to talk about everything. And that just, yeah, that drove me nuts. So there, that's like the side effects. Uh, that's a kind of like the downside of being an associate. And in my video, I'll cover more. I mean, unfortunately, they are dentists who pray they're young. They take advantage of you when you, are just a new grad when you don't know much. And I lost $10,000 in my first job because I didn't read the contract clearly. And my principal was not, I mean, he's a great clinician, but colleague wise, not so much. So that's why that's the whole reason why I'm trying to do YouTube and to Instagram is eventually I want to share my experience and really help the dental students and the new grad to avoid the mistakes that I did. So for, for sure. Yeah, those are those are the challenges that I encountered. Oh, somebody's asking, oh, this is kind of related to that. How was the transition from graduating to practices as far as finding a job and how prepared you were after dental school? Mm. So remember I said that at the end of the third year, I went to work in, as a student practitioner. So when I was working as a student practitioner, I got offered the job on the spot already. But it's like in a really rural community. So I didn't want to go there. But the dentist really liked my work and like how I work as a dentist. So he actually gives me his contact of um, where pretty much I, had, I took my first job. So that is kind of three referral. So I would say if you be a good student and you expose yourself to different dentists, like word of mouth, eventually you will get recommended somewhere. Um, there's also a lot of job postings in like small communities. Um, so I went to that town, but at that time I was still with my boyfriend at that time, which is now my husband. He wanted to tag along. <laughs> So he cold emailed everybody in the town and eventually he got like 10 job interviews. So as long as you drop a resume somewhere, you will, you will um, get it. Oh, one thing that I think that helped me get the job more easily is that throughout dental school, I kept, I, I created a dental portfolio. I don't know if that's a common thing in the States, but in Canada, nobody does it. My husband was doing it and my husband told me to do it. Basically, you, I just do take a lot of before and after pictures 
uh, capture all the good cases that I did. So when I apply to a job, not only just have a resume, I have a word documents of what I'm capable of and what's my quality of work like. And I I heard that stood like that made me stood out and that's actually what I used to apply to the job in downtown Vancouver right now as well and my boss really liked my root canal and he really liked my ortho so that's why he hired me um it was definitely difficult I was struggling with root canal uh, when I first graduated my first ever root canal molar in a real patient um you can check out a post on my Instagram, but in short, I ended up not finishing root canal because finished patient had a heart attack and I panicked and almost perfed the tooth, almost turned into an implant, things like that. It's, it's challenging, but I ended up taking a lot of courses after school to feel more comfortable about root canal. And now it's like one of my favorite procedures, but I hated it so much in school. Um, somebody is, this is relating to, uh, you treating children in dentistry. Um, mm. Have you ever had any instances in which a child refuses to cooperate? If so, how have you dealt with the situation? Mm. Yes, of course. Yeah, that's why you need a pedodontist in town. But uh, I have a couple of rules when I treat um, kids. I usually... Usually children who are really inquisitive and very curious, those uh, children are really that more predictable. You just have to do a lot of show and tell, tell and then they will be cooperative. But, but uh, children that are, who are really quiet, those children are really hard to predict. So before I see the uh, patient, children, I always tell them stories about sugar bugs and I let them be familiar with the tools that I use. Um, and then I tell the parents, I don't allow parents sitting in the room, same room as, as the patient, because I need to build a report and I need to take charge of the situation. If the patients, if the parents are worried, they can stand behind me and overlook the children. And that usually helps a lot. But I tell the mom and the dad that I don't treat crying children. And I, my and our goal is not to just get work done, is to create a nice experience for the little kids so they don't develop dental anxiety over time and they will be a good patients when they're adults. You will see a lot of dental anxiety in adults because they had traumatic experience when they're little. So my goal is to create a pleasant and fun experience for them. So as soon as the kids start to cry, start to lose it, I just refer. I don't try to 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 finish or to work i just refer okay. um, so i think okay this question is usually asked to our u.s dentist but i don't really from what i know i don't know if it really applies to canadian dentists um they're asking how long does it usually take to pay off dental school loans but oh, i've heard that, yeah. yeah yeah go ahead what you say yeah. i've heard uh dental schools in can, um, in Canada are pretty cheap. Is, does that still apply to you? Uh, UBC has the highest tuition. So as I mentioned, we is, um, it's $200,000 um, for four years, Canadian dollars. McGill is much cheaper. I think it's almost like 30% off of that. US, yes, it's a lot higher. I think NYU, it's like closer to 400,000 USD. Oh, I can't imagine that when you graduate. So, um, I mean, that is also why people try to go to Canadian school. And that's why Canadian schools are a lot more competitive, things like that. But for me, how long I took to pay out my student debt, as I mentioned, is about two years, but it depends on how you plan out your finance too. I started investing early when I was a student as well already and you will you don't have to really worry about the tuition part because sorry in the end for sure you will you will pay it off but two years it's quite fast I have colleagues they pay it off five years seven years but it depends on how you live right I lived very frugally for two years after graduation I didn't really buy anything. I, I had chicken <laughs> every day. Um, and I pretty much like all my saving went to uh, my 
my uh, line of credit, my debt. But I also know some dentists, they get a car right after and then they start to invest and they they pay it gradually over time. So it, it depends. But you're able to pay it down pretty fast if you go rural. I don't know if you guys are curious about how much dentists make. Uh, I think somebody actually asked that. Um, I know in the U.S. the average for general dentists is a hundred, hundred twenty thousand USD. But how much do Canadian dentists make straight out of dental school? Mm, it's a very common question, and I think it's a really important question to know because so much debt, right? But it's a hard question to answer because it depends on how many days you work, how many. But I can just tell you how much I make. I don't really mind. So when I first graduated, but when I first graduated, I, I got accepted into pretty busy practice though. So my schedule was pretty busy already. And I wouldn't say I'm a very slow dentist. I think I was already pretty fast graduating dental school. So um, at that practice, I made about, like every month will be consistently about 20,000 to maybe 20,000 or like seven, 16 to 20,000 every month. But my very first job, like there was even one job that I only stayed for a month or two months before that, that was not able, able to book me. It was, I was doing cleaning. I was working full time, but my schedule was not full. And I was only doing a lot of cleaning exam. I was only make, my first paycheck was $624 a month. <laughs> it was really sad. So um, depends on, what job you end up landing in and also your own speed. I also was taking a lot of courses right, right off the bat. I recommend you to front load your CE. Your CE, CEs are really expensive. It's like a couple thousand every course, but invest in that because if you invest early, the rate of return is the highest. So I invested so much money when I first graduated from uh, dental school. So I got very comfortable in doing uh, extractions and root canals and got pretty fast in doing that and I also got to do ortho so the amount of procedures that I was able to do was a lot so at the end towards the end of my a year so when I first graduated I would say maybe ten thousand dollars a month is perfectly achievable um, to maybe fifteen thousand a month and then at the end of my one year and a half, I was making about 20,000 to some good months like December, people want to use up their insurance, I can make up to 28,000 a month. Now I'm back in Vancouver, I don't work. I but I used to work six days, like five to six days a week. Now I work only four days a week. I'm still able to, and the BC fee guy is a lot lower than the rural community I was in. So also depends on the fee guide you're in. Um, the right now I work fewer days, lower fee guide, but I'm still be able to maintain about twenty five thousand. But um, sometimes I can push to thirty five thousand a month. Yeah, but um, that's me. But I also know colleagues who are still making about in the ten thousand range. But I also know colleagues who are super fast, super capable, who's making forty thousand a month. So the range is big. Um, so, uh, there's a question about, um, do you have any tips for taking the DAT? But I know the American DAT and the Canadian D DAT are different. Um, you guys still have biology, chemistry, uh, reading, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and math, I think. I think, I, I heard the Canadian DT doesn't have math, but instead manual dexterity, or am I, is there also math on there as well? Mm, I t but however, by the time I, it's been so long since I took DAT, so I don't think I'm in the best position to give like a very specific details about what the test entails. But I, I think it's a, there's a little bit difference, but definitely transferable. Cause I took both American, I both, I took both US DAT and Canadian DAT. Oh. And I just, I prepare them the same, just in case if I don't get into Canadian school, I could go into US. Um, I prepare them the same, like for the science part, I actually use MCAT book to prepare for DAT because I did consider medicine as well. So I also took MCAT. 
Um, and I also took PAT. I probably should take all the exams there are available. Um, I just use uh, the, I find the reference book for MCAT is a lot more detailed than DA, uh, for DAT. So I use the science section in MCAT to study for DAT and that's perfectly sufficient. The DAT science part and English part is a lot easier than MCAT. So I think if you can do well in MCAT, you would do well in DAT. Um, but there is that, yeah, the manual dexterity part. When I took the exam, there was no car soap carving anymore. So I didn't have to prepare for that. But I know there is that uh, that section, what is it called? The PAT, right? Where you have to, yeah, like, line. That, that part is uh, basically just practice over, over, over again. And, um, you know, I actually applied to UT and UBC, but my TA PAT score was really bad because when I was doing that exam, I bubbled it wrong and I ended up spending so much time erasing my Scantron sheet and moving the answer. So I didn't finish my PAT. But so I got waitlisted at UFT, but I still got accepted into UBC because my GPA was high. Um, but in, in my conversation, I was asking UFT how high I'm ranked on my waitlist. I was first in a waitlist because there is they're really heavy on PAT score. So when they they told me the UFT admission office, they told me that when they look at DAT, like PAT is a lot more important than the other scores. So um, yeah, I guess really spend some time during practice. Uh, but PAT, I, there are a lot of books like. There are a lot of books out there and I think you just have to be fast because there are a lot of questions. They're not hard questions, but there's a lot of questions. I noticed that you said that um, for the PAT section, you said you were bubbling in Scantrons. Was it a paper test when you took it? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Is, is, is the computer now? Yeah, um, for the American DAT, you have to go to a specific testing center and they have these special computers that are timed and you take all of it online. Oh, I see. Oh, that might be better. Because <laughs> <laughs> I have to write all the answer and transfer the bubble sheets and doing the old way. Oh, yeah. Uh, so another question is... Uh, Based on your experience practicing and in dental school, what kind of skills or personality traits do you think someone should have when they're entering dental school? Mm, I think number one is you have to like people. Um, if you don't like handling with people, um, is you're going to have a really hard time in this career because I mean, dentistry itself is frustrating, yes, but the people part is the most difficult part. And that that's not just with patients, it's with your staff as well. You need to be able to um, let people trust you and like you, but still be yourself and not feel like you're bending over backwards to please everybody. At the end of the day, that can be very draining. And second part is, um, I think we all suffer imposter syndrome Imposter syndrome is actually a term just for high achievers. So all the dentists, all the dental students, even pre-dents like you, you're going to feel you're very inadequate um, many times in your career and in your pursuit in dentistry. But you just need to know that you don't need to be good at something in order to start. You just have to start and then you get better over time. Um, but I think your resilience will build. So I would say... I don't have to encourage you to study hard and work hard because we all do. But I would say you will need to have that type B personality or train to have that type B personality throughout dental school and not take everything so seriously and don't refer all the failures back to how you are as a person um, or else it will feel very discouraging. Oops, sorry. One sec. Ah. Okay, sorry. So I think, um, what was it? Uh, somebody's asking, it's actually a question about UBC and I guess we could apply it to all Canadian dental schools. Um, I know American dental schools, uh, in addition to DAT and GPA, they also look a lot at shadowing and extracurricular activities. And mm -hmm. they're just asking if, they're asking 
<laughs> that extracurricular activities uh, or they weighed very heavily in their admissions process. Mm. Um, when I applied, they actually took out of the extracurricular stuff. But I know um, like UFT, UFT also didn't have extracurricular stuff. US, there's a lot. Canadian school, but I think they include that again in um, IUBC because there were a few students that UBC thought good students, but end up not good students. So it actually got UBC into a lot of lawsuits. Anyways, I won't go into detail for that, but uh, for the extracurricular stuff, um, it is not as important, I have to say, it is not as important as academic. You, um, dentistry is actually very GPA based, but it's not like you have to have a very good number. You just have to show that you have an upward trend if you don't have a very high GPA, then yes, you will have to really invest on your extracurricular stuff. Like um, one of my friends, he had like really bad undergrad GPA, like maybe like a B or B minus, but he ended up doing a master and a PhD and published a really good thesis. So he still got in. And that doesn't say anything about who he is. Like he ended up graduating like the top five in our class. So even if you take a little longer to get in, it's okay. But extracurricular staff, um, I heard from some of the admission staff talking about how they're not, it doesn't have to be all dental related. And you should show that you have to shadow some dentists or take dentistry seriously. But they actually prefer you to have a diverse uh, experience. And they also looked at more of a, your commitment, like to like they don't want you to just do something for a week and then quit something that you can kind of stick through. So church leadership or um, tutoring, things like that. If you have been doing that for a long time, even though it's not dental related, it's still a really good experience to include. Uh, so. I always like to ask this for dentists just because it's a current issue, but mm -hmm. has the pandemic affected your practice or lifestyle negatively in any way? Mm, yeah. So during the lockdown, we were jobless, right? I didn't work from March till June. Um, and during that time, I have to be honest, I did went through like panic attack, depression, and in the end, it's just knowing that it's okay, everything will work out, especially if you have other debt. So I don't have any more student debt, but I have a lot of debt for my startup practice. So when I couldn't make any income, I was panicking. Um, and also um, for in terms of how we practice, there was a big transition into now the new norm, but we are actually such adaptable humans because that's what dentistry, dental school trained us to be. You will, you, you end up get, you end up adapting to whatever that's coming at you. So um, in the first two weeks, I feel like I couldn't breathe every day at work because the two layers of mask with shield, with light, with gown. Um, it just makes me headache, makes me have headache all the time. And I'm a snacker. I'm not able to snack anymore. I feel like I'm constantly craving for sugar. <laughs> um, but in the end, you kind of get adjusted to it. In terms of my schedule, my schedule hasn't been affected by too much. I've still been pretty busy. But definitely, you get a lot more short notice cancellation. You get a lot more um, people who called in sick, let it be true, real or not. Um, the hygiene appointment is a lot more empty than before, for sure. But if people have toothaches, uh, they still go see dentists, but they don't clean their teeth during pandemic. Okay. This is a question that I'm actually curious about too. So um, I know in the US, um, if you want to specialize, you would have to just apply for a specialty program in your fourth year of dental school. So I think my question is, have you ever thought about specializing? And if someone in a Canadian dental school wanted to specialize, what would be the process for that? 
Um, I never look into the specializing application, but I just talked to one of my colleagues who got accepted into UBC Peds. What he told me was, um, yeah, they look at the marks again, but most ma mainly, most importantly, is like your experience after graduation. I, you can apply to grad school like right like in your fourth year, but I think that probably will be mainly GPA based. And also if you do any research throughout school time. Um, yeah, so if you, you just have, yeah, she, he told me they only look at GPA. Inter of course, there's interview components and extracurricular, um, whether he had any pedo exposure and whether he did any research. He did some research through in undergrad, so he got in. Um, mm. uh, how has dentistry affected your lifestyle in terms of do you still have lots of time to travel or spend with family and things like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, dentistry is really great in, in that sense is that if you're not a business owner, uh, if you're just an associate dentist, once you're off work, like you're you're done. You don't have to you don't have to think about more, unless if you really had a bad day or a really difficult case that you have to plan. But the work life balance is really great. Um, uh, that's setting us. Of course, as a new grad, there's not so much a work life balance because all you want is to pay off your student debt as soon as you can. So people just work six days long hours every day. But when finance is not an issue. You're, when finance is not an issue, um, it's definitely in your hand. For, for example, I'm in Taiwan in my two months holiday right now. Like with other profession, it's going to be really hard to do that. Um, but one downside about dentistry as a career in terms of work-life balance is that it's a career that doesn't allow you to travel much. Because whenever you travel, you have to, if you're an associate dentist, you have to find somebody to low come for you. Um, and it's hard to find. Um, and you cannot do it too often a year. If you're a business owner, you definitely don't want to leave because the overhead is so high. You just can't afford losing anybody walking through your door. It's not a career where you can remotely perform. It's not like a tech. You can go travel and work from home. Um, pandemic, yes, everybody has teeth. Everybody has two problem. You probably will not become jobless unless pandemic hits, but pandemic, it's not a norm. So I don't think you have to worry about that too much. Hopefully there's no COVID-20. Um, but um but yeah, those are the downside. But work-life balance, it's great for dentistry. And I think just to end everything, I always like to ask this question at the end because I feel like it summarizes everything really well. Um, so if you could go back in time and kind of meet yourself when you were applying to dental school or, when, or even when you just graduated from dental school, what would you tell yourself? If I were to go back in time and tell myself when I graduate dental school is uh, when I apply for dental school is that like it doesn't matter how inadequate you feel. Like, you guys might feel like, oh, it was so easy for me because my GPA was so high and I was able to get in so easily. But I was so hard on myself that I I wanted to get into dental school as soon as I could. I was so hard on myself on every subject. If I get one question wrong, I, I threw up. Like my mental health, my physical health was not great. Um, going through undergrad and applying to dental school. And my family was having a really difficult time for some stuff too. So my personal life was really messy too. But, you know, I... I'm really glad that I didn't give up on myself and I, I push it through. So I would say um, work hard, chase excellence, but not perfection. And I think I was chasing perfection. So I was dying. But, and then um, when I graduated dental school, what I would told myself is, mm, you, will, you must feel very underprepared right now, but you will be fine after a year and a half. Um, and do not be so self-conscious about what you don't know. Focus on what you have learned and what you know already. Because when I graduated, I was so worried that I, will look, um, I look so young and I don't know what I'm talking about. There's still so many procedures I don't know what to do. 
So when I was treatment planning, I was tiptoeing around the patients. When I was introducing myself to the patient, whenever the patient asked, oh, you look really young, that just throw me off guard. I don't know what to say next. Um, so yeah, focus on what you know and focus on your strength. What you don't know will improve like over time. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Lee. Uh, and I think with that, um, we are going to end this session. It was really great hearing about all the practices and methods that you use in Canada, because I am sure a lot of viewers are from the US and they're really curious about what goes on in the country right above us. But yeah, once again, thank you, Dr. Lee, for everything. Thank you so much, Karen, for having me. It was so fun. And I think um, for everybody watching this, the quiz is in the description of this video and I also posted it beforehand this time. So I'm gonna open it up right now. And then um, Dr. Lee's contact info is on this page here and you can find her on Instagram and YouTube. Okay. Okay. I just ended the stream. Oh, thank you so much, Karen.